All right. So as you may have noticed, uh, I'm not Jessalyn, <laughs> but you did find the right place. So this is developing accessible and engaging presentations. Uh, Jessalyn actually put this workshop together and I've just uh, stepped in to deliver it for her today. And this should be fun. This is my first time uh, working with this workshop. So expect the unexpected. <laughs> All right, so uh, the agenda for today is uh, we'll be doing several uh, parts uh, of, of, let's see, still getting organized. There we go, okay. So we're uh, splitting this into several parts. Uh, first thing we'll do is we're going to observe an example of a screen reader in action. Uh, most of us that don't rely on screen reader technology really don't have much of an idea of how it works and what it feels like to um, have to rely on senses other than sight when, uh, when reading a document, uh, watching a presentation, or anything like that. So that's, uh, that's going to be the first activity. Uh, then we're going to consult a resource on how to efficiently build accessible presentations. So we'll look at uh, all of the, uh, the different ideas and the different um, elements of, of accessible design, and we'll discuss how, the, how they can be incorporated into our uh, daily documents, into our presentations, things like that. Uh, we will collaboratively collaboratively practice redeveloping inaccessible slides. So there are, uh, starting with a couple of uh, examples, what we'll do is at that point, we will divide up into a couple of breakout rooms, spend some time on fixing some slides that have some obvious, some not so obvious um, inaccessibility issues. Uh, and uh, we'll come back and discuss what we may have discovered uh, from that and how we applied our knowledge of uh, design accessibility uh, towards uh, redeveloping those, uh, those slides. We're going to observe key design principles in action. And finally, we'll reflect on key learning points that we've gained from this session as a whole. All right, first of all, we're going to observe an example of a screen reader in action. So uh, the example that we're going to be observing is JAWS. So uh, without much further ado, let's begin. We'll start the video. And I think this is, let's see, I think it's a five minute video. Let's, uh, five, five to seven minute video. Let's watch. Hi, my name is Stuart Lawler. I'm business development manager for Sight and Sound Technology here in Ireland, and I'm also head of content creation for the company. Now, I'm here today to talk about screen readers because I also happen to be a screen reader user. And in this case, we're talking about JAWS. So JAWS is an application that sits on your computer and that captures information as it travels to the screen and outputs it in synthetic speech. It's a very efficient and effective way for a blind or low vision person to access information. In its most basic form, it can read text as you navigate through the screen. Uh, before I continue, is everybody okay with the sound? Can everybody hear it okay? Excellent, okay. So if we're on the Windows desktop, for example. Holder view with you, Outlook 57. And I just realized one more thing. It, re it might be handy if I had... These icons as I move around. Need application part one. Need application. WhatsApp. Publisher. Or if I want to search for an application and open Word, for example. Word app. Press like to switch preview. I can do that by pressing enter. 
Email has become a core part of everyone's working life. And I know in my case, I tend to live in Microsoft Outlook. Well, luckily, JAWS works seamlessly with Outlook. So here I am in my inbox, inbox and I'm flicking through my messages. And there's an unread message here. Somebody I've contacted is out of the office. I want to know when she might be back. So let's ask JAWS to read this message. Out of office me, email of message, plain text. I am on annual leave from the 4th, 17th August 2020 and will have limited access to my emails for this. So I know when she's back and I'm going to press escape to close my message. Inbox. Now I do need to check my calendar for a meeting on Friday because I need to check if I'm available at 12 noon. So I'm going to quickly go to my calendar. Go to calendar. And I'm going to arrow over to Friday. Friday, 18 September 2020. One event, one busy. I have one event. I'm not sure what it is, so let's find out. Julian Jackson podcast interview, 10 o'clock to 10:45 Friday, 18 September 2020. Time busy. Okay. So I'm in, I'm meeting someone at 10 o'clock for a podcast interview, but it's only going to take 45 minutes, so I can slot in a meeting at 12 o'clock. Well, the internet has become a key part of all our lives, hasn't it? And indeed, many people need to use the internet many times every day. In fact, a lot of work-based work applications are now web-based, meaning that you use them from your web browser. Luckily, JAWS works with all the major web browsers on the market. In this case, I'm using it with Microsoft Edge, and I've already opened the Google homepage. Google. I'm going to search for assistive technology research. And I'll press enter. When I, when I get my search results and they've just come up, JAWS will quickly allow me to scan or skim the results to see what I might like. This is what we call in screen reader terms, moving by headings. I can easily flick through these search results, pressing enter on the one I need to access and interrogate it further. Here's how JAWS works in Microsoft Word, a word processor used by so many people to do so many things every day. Well, in its most basic form, it can read the documents I have on screen. We are looking at how screen reading technology like JAWS can interact with standard applications such as those found on the Microsoft suite. Now, if I want to interrogate that document a little more, I might want to see, for example, what size font and what is the font characteristics of what I'm currently writing in. So I'll ask JAWS to give me some info on the font. 14 point, black on white, aerial, normal style, line spacing, zero lines, pair. So I'm using 14 point aerial, which is fine. The word JAWS in this document, I want to highlight or bold it to make it stand out. Interact with, inter can, JAWS. There's the word JAWS, I'm going to highlight it. JAWS. And I'm going to bold it. Uh, bold it, 14 point, black. And JAWS has confirmed for me that that word has been bolded. And finally, at the top of this document, black. Assistive tech. I have a line that says assistive tech. I want to make that uh, into a heading, tech. and I want to center it center. so that it stands Next. out as the title of the document. I'll now ask JAWS to give me characteristics to verify that. So I can tell that my document is now centered and ready to go. All right, so uh, what were your thoughts about that? If that was the first time that you've, uh, you've encountered uh, the experience of using JAWS, uh, does anybody have any thoughts that they'd like to share with us about that? Eva? Yeah, yes. Um, well, it looks like that he knows how to use the computer and the like how to talk to Joe's. Um, yeah, like you, you feel that there is a, um, a language that he's using in his, using his hands to get there because um, I don't know what he was doing and how he was talking to Joe so that Joe is, is answering him. Yeah, it's, it, you definitely get the feeling that uh, there is a learning curve with JAWS, and uh, I think he was using shortcuts. So uh, while he was while he was narrating what he was doing, um, I don't think JAWS was responding to him. I think it was the 
uh, the keyboard shortcuts that he was using. But uh, yeah, it looks like he was uh, definitely an adept user and he knows the shortcuts and he knows exactly what JAWS is capable of, capable of and, and how, to, how to use it. Uh, Sarah, did you have a comment? Hi, Derek. Um, I just wanted to, to answer your question. So this wasn't the first time I saw um, a screen reader in action, but this was the first time I really had to focus to understand what JAWS was saying. Um, I've, I've seen it a couple of times, but it seems like this individual has the speed up so quickly um, that, yeah, it was really difficult for me to, to even know what JAWS was saying. It was like, blah, 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 blah. you know, it was like on like a three times the speed. Um, one commonality that I noticed is just how, uh, for me personally, the JAWS voice or the automated voice is so aggressive and almost difficult to listen to for me personally. So, um, you know, it's a, it's something, it seems like you have to learn to get, you know, to, to pick up how quickly to listen to, and also to, to be able to, to kind of uh, tolerate how uh, that sort of very robotic voice telling you things. Yeah, for sure. Um, and I do have a comment about that, but, but uh, first, uh, Kelly, go ahead. Yeah, I just feel like the you they must be able to slow or speed up their narration for sure it's got to be an option and and i agree completely with it sounding very unhuman <laughs> i guess is a good term for it it's very robotic hard yes. to listen to it is it's 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 almost jarring if that's the first time you've heard yeah. jaws working it really kind of uh gets your attention and uh it is it's one thing I was going to say about it is that comparing it to Siri, Alexa, Google Voice, um, these are uh, resources that are put out by major companies in the tech industry. They have the resources to uh, focus on that side of the technology. So they can uh, you know, give us a, a, a multitude of different Siri and Alexa voices to choose from, whatever is pleasing to us, whatever we prefer to hear. But JAWS kind of in contrast to that, uh, it's, it's, it shocks us into, whoa, what is this? But on the other hand, once you start listening to it, do you think that people might get uh, comfortable, familiar with it? Um, and, and one thing I noticed also, uh, one of the questions was, is there a way to slow down the narration that came up a couple times? And yes, users have the ability to, to speed up and slow down the, the voice itself. So you can clearly see by this clip that the user is very comfortable with using JAWS and actually um, probably quite adept at just interpreting these, these audio cues, knows exactly what he's gonna hear and knows exactly um, you know, the, the speed that he's comfortable with getting this information. Um, Laura, did you have a, a comment? Well, I was just thinking, uh, Derek, because that the way that you were saying, you know, it was it was almost like um, it was this um, tool to this person, right? Like it was just a tool. It was just a pencil. So it didn't really matter. Um, and but one of the things that stuck out for me and it was something that I learned years ago, um, having to do some uh, website design, but how headings had to be, when we were trying to make them accessible, we had to use the different structures of headings. And and seeing in that example, how he was able to scan through the headings, I'm like, that's the first time I saw why. So anyway, okay. Yeah, actually, to your point, Laura, um, when you're working in a document, uh, the best thing to keep in mind is a lot of things that we're used to doing, like uh, changing the 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 font, you know, because oh, this is this is fairly important. I'm going to fix the size of the font, make it bold. It's going to really stand out. I think after watching that that video, you begin to realize that unless it's actually using the heading style, it's not going to be interpreted by a screen reader. Um, it, it's just going to blast right through that uh, at whatever, <laughs> whatever speed the user has chosen, but it's going to blast right through that and no one will, will pick up on the subtleties that, that we've added ourselves. 
so that's a good question. It's a good comment. Uh, just because actually that's one of the things that I point out in, in my own workshop, uh, uh, designing these documents is uh, that the things that we're used to doing, like hitting spacebar, just to sort of line things up a little bit, or hitting enter just to, you know, just to move everything to the next page. A lot of that doesn't translate very well to screen readers. So uh, it kind of makes you really realize the importance of relying on the the language that uh, that we can't see, the language of the document that is built in uh, so that screen readers and other display technology can interpret uh, what the end user is going to going to need. So a couple more things about JAWS. Uh, it is it's subscription based. It's not free, um, but people uh, or students I think for the for the K to 12 years, at least, um, they have the luxury of being able to use JAWS most of the time if they require it. Uh, it's made available to, to students, but that doesn't follow through to adulthood. So again, so if an adult requires using JAWS, this is a bit of an investment. Um, and again, it doesn't really compare to the other commercial speech recognition services like Siri, Alexa, and Google uh, because they're the result of major investments. So at some point, the user needs to become acclimated to the sound of that computer voice, uh, despite the initial reaction of, of just being, wow, this is really jarring. Uh, JAWS actually has not really modified or improved on that classic, even though it sounds archaic, um, they've still been using that that same voice sound uh, just because it's effective and recognizable. So uh, now you when you hear that voice, chances are you recognize right away that oh, that's that's Jaws. I know that voice. So it kind of uses that um, that archaic voice as its own signature in a way. And after listening to it, um, I would imagine that users of Jaws, just want they just want to hear the uh, the content they just want to hear it uh, they want to fix the speed that they're comfortable with and uh, they just want to get through that document uh, a question uh, do you know if jaws allows to change the voice uh, that's a good question um, i'm actually not sure if, if it has options uh, such as that i mean i've i've used jaws uh, it i'm not a regular user of jaws um, I'm not actually sure if, if it allows you to customize uh, the voice itself. Now, I would imagine that you can change maybe the, the tone of the voice or the maybe the, um, you know, higher or lower frequency uh, and the speed, of course. Um, I'm not sure if you can provide a different voice altogether with JAWS. Uh, but like I said, that's part of the that's part of the recognition factor of of JAWS. So uh, that's that was an example of of JAWS. For me, it it certainly isn't something that I'm used to hearing. Um, although I've heard that that type of voice uh, for many years, it seems to be a, an open source standard. Actually, I don't think it's owned by JAWS, but. Uh, any other comments that uh, anybody wants to point out or? Okay. Oh, Sarah, did you have something else? Sorry, I just noticed your, your hand. Would you happen to know any um, customer like feedback or what are some of the things that folks who regularly use JAWS, what are the things that are, are problematic or difficult for those that are part of that clientele? Uh, the difficulty, probably. Um, I don't know any any resources offhand that I could offer you, but I think just just playing with with that question in my mind, the first thing that comes to mind is the the number of keyboard combinations and shortcuts that one needs to know in order to navigate. Um, a lot of things that might seem first nature to us, if you took them away, um, we would probably be really at a loss of how to navigate through a document. 
So I'm thinking that the, the number of, of navigation shortcuts, you know, how to, um, how to navigate your way through a document, how to pull up the information that you really need, like in the video he mentioned getting the details so that you could determine what the font size was right away without looking at it, you know, if something was centered, um, any other styles that have been applied to that portion of the document. So um, even selecting. So if you're highlighting or selecting, a lot of these things are uh, just second nature to us using a mouse and just kind of clicking, highlighting. Um, that tool has is, is really not part of that, that tool bag, essentially. So once you take that tool away, it's replaced with things like keyboard shortcuts. And there's probably, um, I know that there's a fair number of, of keyboard shortcuts in JAWS. So the initial learning curve uh, must not be too fun <laughs> for JAWS. A fair bit of work goes into uh, to learning how to navigate through JAWS, that's, that's for sure. All right, so thanks for that and all the comments. Uh, next, we'll consult a resource on how to efficient, efficiently build accessible presentations. And for that, actually before that, um, let's see. Yeah, let me provide the resource to you. Now for this, I'm gonna switch over to a browser. So uh, let's, switch over to this browser. And here is the, uh, the page that is put out by Teaching and Learning. And I'll just paste that link in the chat there. So what we're going to do is we're going to take uh, a few minutes just to read through. Let's say uh, this reading time is six minutes. Let's take about seven minutes. Uh, we'll read through this document and just sort of at our own pace, just to sort of get an idea of some of the different uh, different uh, types of, of elements that go into building an accessible document. And uh, pay attention to, to all of these details because this is what we're going to use shortly after that to divide up into groups and fix up a document that contains many glaring errors and some subtle errors as well. So I'll start the, uh, the time here. On, let's take seven minutes or so.
So I hope you were able to read through that document. Um, note that you can all, any, uh, go back to it at any time. It's a, a great reference for uh, building PowerPoint slides. Um, lots of information on different uh, elements that you should keep in mind when building presentations. Uh, now I'm gonna back up one slide here. Um, there was a, a question here. There was a, a, a poll. How would you rate yourself on the following skills? I don't have a poll to, to uh, include here, but what I did want to include, uh, let's see if I can pull it up here. I did want you to at least uh, think about this and perhaps by the end of the session, you'll be able to uh, answer on your own. Let's see. I do have a list of some of these skills. So I'm just going to put them in the chat. And you can look them over and just think to yourself, um, what, how do you think your own skill levels would, would rate? So these would be slide masters, uh, building descriptive links, constructing effective tables that read horizontally, not vertically, adding alt text to images, and contrast color checkers. Uh, and finally, built-in accessibility checker. Did you even know that that existed? Have you used it before? Um, does that help? Do you, do you find it helpful? Uh, anybody want to comment on maybe what they, they uh, found from that document? Uh, maybe that you didn't know or you're surprised at? Any comments about it? <laughs> zeros across the board. I thought I was like pretty good with accessible slides. And yeah, I'm, I'm pretty, I'm batting zero too, if that's even the right term. <laughs> yeah, it's a baseball term. I'll take it. <laughs> um, yeah, there's a lot of, there's a lot of things that we might overlook when we're, when we're creating these slides. And of course, no one is expecting perfection, but there's a lot of if you break down those those rules, there's a lot of simple things that that we can apply on. Uh, I was going to say a daily basis, but unless you know, uh, when we're building a document, um, there's a lot of these simple little rules that we can just uh, apply on our own. Um, one of the things that I've developed, uh, just kind of a not even thinking about it, is using the. Um, let's see. Let's go back to that list. Uh, Oh, color contrast tool, yes. Um, building descriptive links. Uh, that just seems natural to me. And I do it a lot when I'm putting together uh, information on the IT site. And what I try and do is try to provide a descriptive link uh, without having the, the screen reader that I know occasionally people might be uh, using. Uh, having that descriptive link available without having to read the entire, uh, uh, you know, HTTP colon slash slash, and then a series of, you know, uh, letters and numbers that may, you know, not all URLs are, are perfectly readable. So what, I've, what I normally do is um, I'll typically look for, if it's a document, for example, that I'm linking, I'll highlight the title of the document or some other uh, descriptive phrase that I could use to describe that document. And I'll paste that in where it needs to go. And then I'll grab the, uh, the URL for it. And I'll just copy that. And then as I highlight the title of the document, or in my document, I'll just, uh, you, can, you can usually right click and then select link. What I do is I remember a handy keyboard shortcut. And that is Control K. That is uh, a way that you can quit. Now, this works for most, um, uh, for, like for Word, for um, anything that you're using to build a document. Um, that will allow you to create that descriptive link. And I use that without thinking. Just highlight, control K, paste in my, my URL, and hit enter, and it's done. So uh, that's my, uh, my observation from there. Uh, let's see. Uh, Heather just discovered the accessibility checker. 
It is. It's a great tool. And even better is that you can have it running in the background. So as you're writing up your document, you can fix these things uh, as they come up. Uh, it's also a wonderful tool because it really uh, shows you, it makes suggestions. It shows you where in the document that, uh, that it has encountered uh, an issue, we'll say. Um, and it takes you there. It, it can suggest what you do in order to fix fix the document. It is super helpful. Uh, yeah, Noel is uh, yeah descriptive links. Uh, it just it just makes sense to me. I'm always really conscientious, even when I'm typing an email in Outlook. The last thing I want to do is have a link that that stretches across three lines for someone. Um, and then after all that, you know, it doesn't even work. So they'll have to highlight it and copy and paste into a browser. Um, let's see, color contrast. Wesley, that's a good, good point. Uh, color contrast tool for images and text you may use in PowerPoint slides. Uh, that's another thing that a lot of times it's just intuition that guides us on color contrast. You can sort of tell without using a tool. Um, most of the time, you know, we're reading black text on a white background or a dark background or dark text on a light background. Once we start to, you know, incorporate a little bit of, of design influence and, you know, images and things like that, what we're doing is we're having these colors blend on a slide or on a screen. And uh, especially when it comes to text and the background, uh, it might really cause uh, a little bit of, of, of difficulty for, uh, for people to, to, to see, to, to, to see that text. Alt text to images is an interesting concept. And that's actually a good point, Heather. Uh, it's one of the oldest um, of all of these skills. Um, at the very early onset uh, of the internet, when, you know, when we were still using uh, Mosaic and, and Netscape, um, I can remember, um, coding in the alt text to images in HTML uh, using a text editor. So it's been around since the beginning. Uh, so this, yes, it is an interesting concept, but it's also something that was recognized as um, critical to support in the very early um, evolution of, of HTML. Uh, oh, sorry, a very basic level. Yeah, <laughs> that's okay. That's okay. Oh, thank you. Thank you for my coffee. Uh, oh, my nice daughter just brought me a coffee. <laughs> All right, so uh, thank you for some of your observations. Uh, next, we will collaborative, uh, collaboratively practice redeveloping inaccessible slides. Uh, so what we're going to do is I'll divide us up into uh, breakout rooms, two breakout rooms. Each of those rooms will have a document to, to work on and uh, we'll, we'll time it for 15 minutes. And let's see, the instructions are within your group, redevelop the following slides to be more accessible than they currently are. You can make any adjustments you deem necessary. Be prepared to share your process. So afterwards, uh, within, uh, well, as we get back together from our groups, um, be prepared, maybe nominate someone or, or something, someone might wanna step up, but um, kind of go over the, uh, the processes, uh, how you made some changes, why you made certain changes, um, and be prepared to talk about that. So uh, the, uh, this, the following six slides are what the uh, document is this is consisting of. I will share you the, the folder that these documents are in in a moment. Uh, note what group you're in. So when I place you in a breakout room, there's two rooms. There's going to be group one and group two. Uh, just make a note of which you're in because I'm going to share with you a link that you can open up. You'll be in a folder that will have group one and group two. So make sure you look at the proper document um, and work with your team on that. So here's the, uh, the following slides uh, is what the document has in it. So uh, this is page one, accessibility agenda. There, you might see some, some things wrong with that, some ideas you might have in order to fix that. Next one here, web accessibility. 
next one is a table, hint, hint. Uh, next one, basic accessible design principles. How can we fix that up a little bit? Next one, PowerPoint templates. Next one is PDF accessibility. And reminder, uh, you're just fixing up these slides. You'll be fixing up these slides. So uh, yeah, not necessarily, don't worry about the content right now, but anything you can do to make them a little more accessible with those uh, elements in mind. All right, uh, what I'll do now is I will uh, share you the link that you'll need for the folder, shared folder. And <laughs> after everything I've said about uh, you know, making descriptive links, uh, those of you who use Zoom regularly know that that's not possible <laughs> in the Zoom chat window. So la voila, there is your beautifully <laughs> formatted link. Uh, that should get you to the folder where you'll see uh, two documents there, uh, group one and group two. And now what I'll do is I will split you up into those breakout rooms and I'll set the time for 15 minutes. And let's just make sure we get that right. 15 minutes. All right. And any questions? All right. Off you go.
Welcome back. Uh, Noelle just sent me a message that she lost power and she wants me to apologize to her breakout room. <laughs> so uh, breakout rooms, uh, Noelle extends her apologies. <laughs> okay, I'd so- I'd like to say that I wish I lost power. <laughs> <laughs> Why is that? <laughs> no, I'm teasing. <laughs> okay, so um, anyone from group one, um, Anyone that would like to kind of share with us some of the changes that were made? Um, I was voted spokesperson. Oh, Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Lisa, uh, did you want to share your screen and take over or uh, did yeah. you want to do it that way? Sure. Uh, feel free. Uh, let me just make sure you are able to do so. Um, yeah, you should be able to. Combination of things we did and things we didn't get to, but I'll tell you what we had in mind. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Um, it says you cannot start screen share while the other participant is sharing. So I guess All right, you easily, can easily enough, I'll just stop my share and. Uh, So I think you're seeing my screen now, everyone. Okay, so we're on slide one. Um, so what we did was we removed the long URL that was referring to a YouTube video here in the first bullet, and we replaced it with something more descriptive, which was essentially the title of the video itself. And we kind of reworded the, the bullet point, say, visit the YouTube video and with the descriptive text being the link to learn more. Uh, we removed the artificial spaces that were between the bullet points. And we talked about changing the font to one of the uh, more appropriate fonts, which I think Arial was one of them, but I don't think we, we were really struggling with getting the changes to actually take place. Um, within this web version of the app. So uh, so apologies, it's kind of a partial marks kind of thing, <laughs> incomplete assignment. <laughs> um, but yeah, we, no were, problem. <laughs> we were discussing uh, changing the font to one of the three re recommended fonts, of which this is not, because I think this is Lucida, yeah. Uh, so that would be in on the first, I think I covered everything, did I miss anything, group one? Okay. Yeah, you don't have to uh, go through everything. Um, okay. Yeah, just if you wanted to point something out, um, yeah, that's All right. fine. Uh, I'll just do the next one because it was a little, a simple change. We just removed the icons that were here that had little images and replaced them with bullet points. Again, the, the font probably needs to change here. That's actually a good point because with, with the images taking over the, or, or replacing what essentially bullets could mm -hmm. could accomplish, um, you then have to decide, okay, do I add an alt text to this image that is essentially just a bullet, or do I dis do I use it as a descriptive and therefore kind of uh, sidestep around that issue, or do you just simply put it as a as a bullet point and and now that the uh, now that a screen reader would see that okay this 
is a bulleted list or a numbered list. It doesn't have to try to interpret, um, you know, do I read out the alt text on this image? And if so, what does it mean to the rest of the um, the list? Yeah. Yeah, I think like we didn't discuss it in, in depth, but I think everyone would probably agree like it didn't really add anything to what the words were saying. So we rather than explain that the hearing had an ear, like I mean, I think it was pretty straightforward. So um, yeah, so we decided to replace those with bullets. Did you want me to go through each slide, Derek, like just quickly? Uh, no, that was fantastic. Okay. Um, yeah, so what we'll do now is uh, if anyone from group two wants to step up and just outline a couple of the things you might have noticed in, in your document. I'll, do you want me to stop sharing, I guess, so group two? Oh, sure. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, I can chat from group two um, and anyone else who wants to step in, feel free. Um, we had a uh, similar problem in actually changing um, and making those changes on the PowerPoint slide, um, I guess just because of the um, Explorer like side of it. Um, but one of the things that uh, we discussed is the table. Um, I believe it was on slide. I can't remember what slide number it was on, but there was a table that was read um, or listed vertically. Um, and uh, we had discussed changing that to um, be read more horizontally because of um, um, the reader being able to read it that way instead. And that's how that they would read it. So we wanted to make sure that that would come across um, in the reader. So that was one point that we had uh, in addition to um, some of the things that group one has talked about. Excellent, okay. So uh, we can all agree that although at first glance, um, probably some of these slides are, uh, you know, work, work well done. Uh, these slides are uh, pretty effective, but knowing that, knowing what we know now, <laughs> if we were to go back, I'm hoping that we would not have zeros across the board any longer, <laughs> knowing that there's a few, a few key issues um, that might come up. Um, one thing that I suspected that might be noticed uh, was the uh, the uh, the background or the the, the template that's used. Uh, not that there's anything wrong with this color, um, but I know in, in another previous session, uh, one of the groups had actually just switched out this color completely with a black and white, which is okay. Don't have to do that. But you can see that with some of the color combinations, like when you uh, uh, when you specify a link, sometimes that link appears in a different color for uh, for some viewers. So that's something to watch out for. Just the different color variations between a link and whether it's not or whether it's been followed or not. All right. So that was excellent. Thank you for that. Well move on. All right, let's see what's next. So we will observe key design principles in action. So with that being said, I'm going to switch back to my browser. And no, nope, we watched that one. All right, so this one I will play for you. Uh, so this is uh, presentation design principles for better PowerPoint design. So this is specifically for PowerPoint presentations. Uh, and this is, I think, seven minutes, about seven minutes. Uh, and this will kind of give you an idea of things to think about uh, on how to make your presentation pop. And try and, uh, uh, try and think about the design principles that we have gone through up to this point and then see how well they merge with some of the ideas put forth in this video. And just to make sure that I'm sharing sound, there we go. And we'll play. I'm often asked how to make presentations more effervescent, how they can have more fizz. So I've come here to show you how you can make your presentation pop. What if I told you that your presentations could look like these examples? They're all using images to enhance your PowerPoint design, both by looking good, but also contributing to the story and helping your audience understand your messages. 
We'll get more into the visual storytelling aspect of this later, so for now, just think about the quality of your images. All of these come from one of my favourite free stock photography sites, Unsplash, which gives you royalty-free images for commercial use, and they're all beautiful. But even beautiful images can't save a slide like this. So it's not just a case of dropping nice images on the slide. You need to understand how to lay them out well and use the crop, colour and artistic effects tools in PowerPoint to treat the images appropriately and help give your presentations a professional look. To see how we've created these kinds of slides, check out the step-by-step -step guides in the links below. Big and bold flood fill images are great, but inevitably you'll need to place other content onto your slides. This is where white space becomes crucial. White space isn't just about adding white space onto your slide. This one has plenty of it, but still looks terrible. It's about creating areas of contrast with clear focal points to draw your attention to the important parts and even create a flow and hierarchy across your slide. This example gives you that luxurious feeling of the full bleed image, but crops it so that the focal point, the watch, is off to one side leaving plenty of white or negative space around the arm for your content. The two sections work nicely together and we've anchored the text in a content placeholder and given it some structure too, by actually reducing the size of the text to give it more room. Again, we've got a full tutorial on how to incorporate white space like this in the link below. Grids are pretty much designed 101 and to be honest, I'm surprised that we've got this far into presentation design without having brought it up you'll likely be familiar with grids from the world of photography. It's called the rule of thirds, where content is divided across a three by three grid, giving balance to content in the image. Well, the same thing applies to presentation design. A grid helps to lay out your content in clear, easy to follow areas. For example, telling the start, middle and end of a story. Using a grid also helps you position content, here, one third of the slide has been taken up with the supporting image, so we've created a grid within a grid to lay out the three pie charts, which helps to create a feeling of harmony and sophistication. And don't think your divisions have to be straight along the grid lines. This slide doesn't apply the rule exactly, but still works really well. What does all of that mean? Well, you can transform a slide like this into this. It's really quick and easy to do in PowerPoint. And you can see our tutorial on using grids in PowerPoint in the link below. Another key presentation design principle is color. Setting the right color palette is essential as it gives everything a consistent feel and allows you to adhere to your brand. The best way to handle colors in PowerPoint is to set your template correctly and use a color theme. And you can find out how to change your PowerPoint color theme using the link below. It's really quick and easy to do, and once you've done it, it will save with the file or template so you don't need to worry about it again. You can use colour in interesting ways to convey meaning. For example, a heat map is a great way to show data ranges like metrics using a scale rather than just plain numbers. That's more helpful to your audience as it allows them to see immediately both the absolute and relative values rather than having to spend time deciphering it. Colour can also focus attention. In complex data sets, contrast colours can help highlight primary data sets compared to everything else data series. You can find more specific guidance on manipulating colours in PowerPoint in the tutorial video in the notes. With your grids, colours and white space considered, you can now get into the specifics of creating slides in PowerPoint. As much as everyone loves visual presentations, we know there are always going to be slides stuffed to the gills with boring text. But by applying the presentation design techniques already mentioned, you can fairly easily transform your text-heavy slide into something that's far easier on the eye. Everything is easier to follow with consistent fonts and the use of colour highlighting. Breaking out the text with decent paragraph spacing helps your audience pass the content more efficiently and the white space around the content created by the contrasting placeholder gives the slide greater impact. As you've probably come to expect by now, this is something you can do using only PowerPoint, and there's a link below to a tutorial on text formatting. Now, while it's not Photoshop, PowerPoint has some neat tools to manipulate images. What if I were to tell you the picture you see here has been constructed out of this? PowerPoint design tools for images are all found on the Format tab on the ribbon. The good ones include the Remove Background tool, which does what its name suggests, 
The colour section allows you to put a colour wash over everything, but also, at the bottom of the menu, you can choose Set Transparent Colour, which will remove a single colour from any image, which is how I've cut out the phone image in this example. Artistic effect is generally terrible, except blur, which is great for changing focus on an image. And the transparency tool, newly available in Office 365, makes pictures transparent, all in PowerPoint. For a full tutorial on this, watch the short video linked to below. And finally, my favourite thing to do, which is to use these design techniques as part of visual storytelling, which can help dramatically improve your presentation. Think about how you can use an image to convey meaning, as well as provide aesthetic appeal. For instance, you could use a skyscraper being constructed to show elements that are taking you higher, with labels up the building showing the key metrics. Or use a common sight from underground stations, the advertising boards on escalators, to show a data series increasing. But the image also gives the figures room to breathe. It doesn't need to be complicated. And this example has been constructed from an image, some text and an arrow to show the 20% of businesses highlighted on the office image. And of course, there's a short video tutorial to show you exactly how to do it noted below. The main thing to remember about effective presentation design is that you probably don't have time to create a totally new concept each time. These ideas are all about helping you create both beautiful and effective presentations. All right, I'll stop it there. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, switch back to some slides. So that was that was interesting. Uh, it gave us a lot of uh, ideas about you know how we can use PowerPoint to really make things pop. Um, and now most of those ideas are based on uh, principles of effective instructional content. Uh, so this is by Mayer. Um, this uh, this list or this, uh, yeah, this list of, of principles, I guess you would say, uh, was actually developed, developed for educational video, but uh, it does transfer to presentations as well. So let's go through some of these uh, principles. So the first one, multimedia. Um, narration and graphics should be used simultaneously and they should match. So any visual should ideally coincide with the topic at hand. Uh, it's just a, a way of, of aligning the, the visuals that you're using with uh, how they impact the message that you're trying to get across. Uh, next is coherence. Avoid any unnecessary info, graphics, or narration. Uh, so this kind of forces you to ask, does certain information belong in a slide or presentation, or can it be added as a supplemental resource, uh, and that sort of thing. So uh, is this something that you would encourage people to look for um, on their own, or does this have to be packed into an already uh, uh, intimidating slide or slide deck? Uh, next one, signaling. So uh, for signaling, uh, narrate or annotate key terms or information as they are presented. So in this case, uh, using something like uh, Zoom, where I could oh, perhaps pick a different color. Oops, that went well. Let me try that again. <laughs> uh, signaling. So there we go. I just used uh, sim uh, the Zoom annotate tool to draw your attention to what I was talking to um, in the slide. That's something that you can do quickly and easily uh, using the annotate tool uh, or other means as well. That's just one idea. Uh, oh, next one. Let's look at segmenting. Uh, segmenting is uh, breakdown into uh, or break down info into manageable chunks by using signaling slides and or agendas. Uh, so this helps you clearly identify the boundaries between uh, or and the boundaries and trans transitions uh, between topics. So as you go from one slide to another, uh, make sure that your audience knows that you know the topic has changed. Um, use the transition to your advantage. Uh, next one here is 
redundancy. Uh, text can add too much redundancy to how we process information, reduce text presented. So things that can be said in as few words as possible are usually more effective. Things that can be said in as few words, <laughs> uh, yeah, redundancy. Uh, this can be challenging at times. Uh, the tendency is to explain everything in the presentation or on the slide. Uh, you have to trust your audience, um, ask them to think about what it is that is being presented or just challenge them. Um, you don't always have to uh, bring all your detail and then just uh, uh, flood the slide with, with everything. So these are only guidelines. Um, it's probably not feasible or reasonable to expect that everything will be perfect every time. But these are just some guidelines to keep in mind when uh, designing slides or redeveloping slides, existing slides. So next, uh, using transitions and animations. Oh, let me move my, uh, <laughs> there. there we go. I'll move my annotation. Um, so a transition is the change between one slide to another. Um, and my favorite is actually using morph. Um, and this is something that uh, Jesslyn actually endorses uh, in, this, uh, in this workshop as well. So what is a morph? Uh, morphing is when you take content from one slide and it blends into the next slide. So you're actually able to focus on an element from your current slide and have it maintain that focus as you switch to the next or transition to the next slide. Uh, this is actually done really simply by creating a duplicate slide. And uh, so you have two slides in your PowerPoint, um, one after the other. Uh, and between the first slide and the second slide, or the second slide, you would list it as a morph transition. And then you can just rearrange the elements on your slide or uh, remove everything you don't need. And then watch as the, uh, actually, let me go back and I'll kind of show you uh, an example. If I can, nope, that's not it. I know, oh, here we go. So you can sort of see as we flip between those slides, it's a nice effect of having that one focused uh, topic. Uh, we're segmenting this. We're going from one idea to another. And that morph brings that one element into focus. And then we can use that to introduce a new topic. So yeah, I have a, a question, Derek. Like, how do you do these? Oh, the morph? OK, let's see. I, I'm conscious of the time. so. <laughs> I kind of blasted through that a little bit quickly, but essentially what you want to do is, uh, let me turn off the, there we go. So what you want to do is, uh, what I'll do, I'll, I'll duplicate this slide down here. So what you want to do is for this slide here, we're going to add a transition and we're going to add the morph transition to this. So whatever is on this slide will morph into what appears here. Now, say we only wanted to have uh, remove this, and we'll remove this, remove the text box, and say this was to appear down here. What we would then do is see if I can do this. I don't think you see that. <laughs> Let me. Oh no, I have a I have a slide within a slide. Uh, let me just make sure I'm sharing the right thing here. Oh yeah, you can actually see it. I think. Oh, that I have no idea how I managed to get that to work. <laughs> I've never done this before. Okay, so this is the morph in progress. <laughs> that didn't work at all. Well, let's try one more time. I'll switch over here. Oh, no, it's not working for some reason. Uh, either it's because I have two instances of slideshows going on, or. Uh... Oh, they, uh, that was it. That was it. 
for some reason, it's really not behaving. Uh, we, we sort of saw it in reverse, didn't we? Look at that. Anyways, I think you get the idea. I just did a, a, a simple morph in about a minute um, and then tried to troubleshoot along the way. So, um, if you have any questions about you know, uh, using the morph, uh, just get in touch with me uh, anytime afterwards. I'll be happy to go through that a little in a little more detail. All right. Uh, I've buried myself here. There we go. All right. So, <laughs> um, one more thing that really helps to uh, explain presentation design uh, and really gives some good points on how to incorporate these designs effectively into a presentation. Um, I'll just direct your attention now to uh, a LinkedIn video. So let's check this out. Uh, now we're not going to watch the video. Um, what I'll do is I will just copy this. Uh, now I'll just copy this link into the chat just so that you can um, have an idea. Um, LinkedIn is also available to everybody. So uh, anybody within the Conestoga community, you can access uh, LinkedIn Learning. Uh, did I share it? I'm not sure if I did. There we go. There we go. <laughs> uh, so this is just an example designing a presentation um, available on LinkedIn. Um, now, uh, I'm not sure how long this is, but you can see that it's uh, it tells you about uh, you know developing your presentation based on your audience, using an outline. Uh, it talks about some of the design essentials, these elements that, that make up your design, uh, how to properly format charts, graphs, and tables using transitions and so on. So it goes into a lot of uh, explanation on how to use all of these elements uh, within a presentation just to make it pop. <laughs> all right. So now we can reflect on some key learning points from this lesson. So we'll pause here uh, for any questions you have about design principles um, and how they're implemented in PowerPoint. Um, or you can uh, please feel free to speak up and uh, mention uh, or comment on anything that you've learned. Uh, but overall, we've, we saw an example of a screen reader in action. Uh, we learned a little bit about accessible slide designs, uh, and we practiced that, uh, and we talked about it. We talked about uh, design principles in action. Um, now, I'd like for you to think about what your key takeaway is from today's session, what you'll be doing in the future that you weren't doing before. Um, and if you wouldn't mind adding your thoughts, um, either speak up or, or enter it into the chat with the couple minutes that we have remaining. Did anybody learn anything mind blowing? <laughs> uh, Lisa, going to use the accessibility checker for sure and be conscious of the colors used. Excellent, yeah. Um, just so you know that accessibility checker is not only available in PowerPoint, but you'll find it in Excel and Word as well. LinkedIn learning, yes. Um, I'm not sure why this is such a secret. I try to mention it in all of my workshops. Um, I feel pretty confident that um, I use LinkedIn learning myself uh, as much as possible, just so that I try to keep up on, on uh, a lot of things in not only technology, uh, but all kinds of things, soft skills as well. There's a little bit for everybody. Uh, Vanessa, definitely want to continue to work on incorporating the accessibility criteria into slides. Yeah, it's a good, uh, it's a good foundation to build on once you know what things to look out for. Uh, the more you do it, the more it becomes just automatic for you. I learned in general about accessibility and to be conscious of it as I walk through my lessons. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, 
Yes, Lisa, it is in Word. Excellent. All right. Um, I was sorry, Derek, yeah, I no. was just typing and then I thought I, I could probably say this easier, but um, I'm just going to practice being more systematic with my slide development going back to the very basics so that by the time I um, get to making all my slides in the fall, it's just going to be second nature. Exactly. I'm so proud of you, Laura. <laughs> uh, excellent. Yeah. So uh, I hope everybody uh, found something uh, useful in this. Um, I will try and send out a summary. I have just some, some basic information to send out to you afterwards. And uh, thank you all. And I hope you are able to take in the rest of uh, Tech for Teaching and have a great day, everyone. Thank you.